Hi there, my name's Lee and I've been a Prince addict since I was eight years old and I'm also a recovering almost rock star and work in the music industry, at least I'd like to call it work, but it's a lot of fun and doesn't really pay. Anyway, that's about me. I'm going to do my presentation. This is my first time doing anything like this, so thank you very much to D'Angela for um, allowing me to do it and I'll try my best to not make it look as if I'm just reading it all off of a piece of paper. Okay. A while back, I got into a series about a recovering alcoholic counsellor, smart-ass ex-music critic called Sam Loudermilk. My brother warned me that there was a Prince mention coming up in the series, so I kind of was eagerly anticipating it. When it came, it was quite the doozy. Just call it Rikers is a little bit of a stretch. Oh, really? So, now you're back to Prince. Oh, love him. I love him. Fuck Prince. Turn it right up. It's not what you want. Walk home. I'm just going to tell him that he made intentionally bad to get out of his horrors deal. Fair music snap. Well, sh Obviously, I got defensive and geeky. No, that's chaos and disorder. I scoffed. He doesn't know his stuff. But what if Loudermilk was right? To look into this, we have to go back in time. December 8th, 1987, riding off his Landmarks album Sign of the Times, Prince famously pulled the Black Album literally off the shelves, creating one of the most famous bootlegs in history. The reasons for this have long been speculated, but one thing that we can definitely ascertain is that Prince was becoming very conscious of what energy and messages he was putting into the public arena. Just weeks later, Prince had created a new album with an uplifting and spiritual message throughout, lyrically if not always orally, to share his road to Damascus moment, Love Sexy. In the promotional video for the first single, Alphabet Street, there was a blink and you'll miss it clip in the video of text saying, please don't buy the Black Album, I'm sorry. Fast forward a few years and two albums worth of spiritual push and pull themed records in Batman and Graffiti Bridge. Incidentally, everybody should read this book by C.V. McInnes for an awesome uh, bit on the spiritual push and pull in Batman and Graffiti Bridge. Well done, C. Lee. Prince is riding high on his biggest hit album in a while, Diamonds and Pearls. And what a better time to be renegotiating the contract to beat all contracts and steal headlines as his $100 million contract was announced. The reality of this deal was that Prince got $50,000 in advance and would receive $10,000 for each album that sold 5 million copies in the same way as Dumbs and Pearls had. So the Love Symbol album followed and whilst Prince didn't lose any cred or momentum as far more complex proposition than Dimes and Pearls, it did reach a slightly smaller audience and made under the required amount for the bonus $10,000. Perhaps the singles with expletive Sexy MF, My Name Is Prince, Getting Less Play contributed to this. The label famously wanted to lead with Seven, which ended up almost an afterthought in promotional terms and nothing in the way of reach like the Diamonds and Pearls singles. Prince is no dummy when it comes to money, so you can almost hear his brain deciding, this isn't working for me. Prince is further incensed when Warner are not interested in releasing the debut album by the MPG. Told him he wanted to sing a song about a black child going fuck wild and they just laughed in his face. In the song Face Down, tellingly released on an emancipation, is reportedly commentary on this event. He goes out and sells it on tour anyway and via a new phone line that he's established to sell music 100 new funk. When Prince wants to release a free CD with a thousand copies of Guitar Player magazine in 1994 of his three-piece jam session with Michael B and Sonny T known as The Undertaker later on when it came out on VHS, he found Warner in opposition to this and started to get frustrated. After all, it's a jam session he recorded at his own studio on his own dime. Why can he not do what he wants with it? <laughs> on his 35th birthday, the 7th of June 1993, Prince changes his name to Symbol. Right. The spat with Warners is well documented and storied enough to say that relationships were frayed and his public persona was becoming confusing to fans, let alone casual observers, none of which helped sales. He also stops playing Prince songs live for the most part. 
September 1993, Warner released a much pressed for hits album with a new song Peach and old song Controversy as singles. Prince reluctantly relented but did not promote it beyond playing Peach, Pope or Pink Cashmere now and then and curiously revisiting B-side I Love You and Me live as well. Whilst in the middle of his most fertile creative periods, he was recording swathes of diverse material with a slimmed down version of the MPG, musically speaking, to a core four, you might say, of Michael B, Sonny T, Morris Hayes and Tommy Barbarella, or Tommy Babs, as no one in the UK has ever called him. There is not only much crossover between the Come and Gold experience various ever-changing track lists over time, but also the songs seem to float around various projects with many of the songs on Come coming from the Ulysses Grand Slam project, the Henry Huang Plum project, or other EPs that the Violet Reality have alluded to, such as a Papa EP and a Tora Tora Experience EP featuring Loose, while Seemly McInnes uh, notes in his aforementioned book that Come was first an EP. In February 1994, Prince sinks one million into promo for the most beautiful girl in the world and it goes number one in the UK on his own NPG records, adding weight to the assertment that Warner are not doing enough to promote his songs. He slips out the beautiful experience and a 1-800 new funk CD and Warner can hardly be bothered to complain. Similarly with MPG Exodus later on March 27, 1995. It's my theory and I don't feel it's a radical one that around this time the artist formerly known as Prince was looking to get as many albums out on Warner as quickly as possible and get out of his contract and his primary focus becomes the gold experience which he's going to keep for himself and he feels is the most representative of where he's at at that time. He even proposes to Warner at one point that both come by Prince with his death date across the cover is released on the same day as a rival album by Symbol, The Gold Experience. Warner are not interested in releasing two rival records at once. Their whole issue is that the marketing team can't keep up with the release schedule. And I'm sure they're not incredibly excited at the idea of Symbol defeating their legacy artist Prince by stacking the track listings of the CDs in his favour. Come is released in August 1994 and there are only two singles with Space being a limited maxi single EP release and both featuring no new B-sides. Only remixes are plenty and one moderately promote single and video made from collected footage from the Three Chains of Gold VHS uh, and that single was Let It Go on August 9th in 1994. August 16th 1994 confusingly Three Chains of Gold video comes out tying in with the symbol and ending of Prince. It's telling that two of the B-sides on Let It Go are Parade Era B-side Alexa de Paris and The Pope from the Hits album and the other being Solo from the album Come. Whilst the Symbol album didn't have much in the way of new songs as B-side, it's still very much expected of Prince whose B-sides are legendary and rank highly in his catalogue. Whilst the artist does play Let It Go live and other Come material, his promotion of fourth Come album is sorely lacking and at most high profile appearances he tends to showcase material from gold. On November 22nd 1994, the Black Album is actually released for a limited time. 13 weeks after Come has come out, Warner seemingly have forgotten about their previous workload issues in a further to capture some of that old prime 80s Prince excitement and money. It's a limited release and isn't the hit Warner are hoping for coming 7 years later and not really supported by Prince. Just a plain black screen video for When To Ruin Love is released as well, which isn't exactly going to hit heavy rotation on MTV. Alan Leeds at the time said, I've got a feeling they're three years late on this. Uh, it was always my assumption that this was a bargaining chip uh, in some way that Prince got further to getting out of his contract. But Karen Lee, Prince's spokeswoman at the time, said he's thoroughly pissed off about it and that he had to sign an agreement and had no choice in it. Also stating, before they agreed to release the Black Album, he owed four albums, and he still owes four albums. How mysterious. March 6th, 1995, both The Undertaker and The Sacrifice of the Victor live VHS are released. March 14th, 1995, Purple Medley is used as a single and intro tape to announce Prince's demise. March 27th, 1995, Tora Tora is busy with Exodus around this time. Um, he's also very fueled by anger at the Warner situation. If you want to know just how much, read the lyrics to The Exodus Has Begun on Exodus, released around this time and recorded in a similar era to the Come and Gold material. 
It's September 1995, the Gold Experience finally comes out as a collaboration with MPG Records. It name checks the year before on a song called Now, ironically, and has lost some momentum, never quite getting the respect and coverage it deserved, despite great singles and promotional efforts and housing the massive hit, The Most Beautiful Girl in the World. This leaves the artist with just two albums with Warner to complete his contract, which he fulfills with two 10 song albums. Come is also 10 songs long. It's almost as if he's creating as many albums as he can from the material, when you consider Symbol and Gold each fill a CD to the point where segues had to be removed to accommodate new songs. We soon saw him celebrating moving on from Warner to release the triple album Emancipation, with some holdovers in material from the recently disbanded lineup of the MPG, like Saviour. With only vault tracks left for Warner to release, which they did in pretty obvious competition with Prince's new releases, again, their concern for flooding the market totally vanishing. And Spike Lee's Prince only soundtrack to Girl 6 on March 19th, 1996, Chaos and Disorder released July 1996, months before Emancipation was November 19th, 1996. Three years later, The Vault Old Friends for Sale comes out in August 24, 1999 just before Raven to the Joy Fantastic comes out November 9th, 1999. The album itself having been submitted to Warner Brothers way back in 1996 with Chaos and Disorder. Cool. So with that timeline established, why did the songs that ended up on Come not stay on the Gold Experience? And what does that have to do with the Black Album? If you look at them th thematically, it becomes quite clear. Come, explicit. Pheromone, explicit, loose, angry, papa, dark, race, hard-edged, political, delivered in a public enemy, informative and opinioned attack mode compared to the empowerment of something like We March, uh, dark, depressing, angry, um, solo, very depressing, let it go, quite downbeat. Um, whilst that does have the kind of hope, it's like just around the corner, he still has to let it go and he hasn't yet and it's a reflective, somber mood and obviously orgasm incredibly explicit. Uh, only space really has much levity to it, no pun intended. Contrastingly, the gold experience is for most part built to uplift and empower. Even I Hate You for all its seething doesn't end up as bitter as dark does. The material on the Black Album has similar themes of S&M in Pheromone and Super Funky Califragilisticexy, gun violence in Pheromone and Cindy C, Papa and Bob George, um, Race, Race and Unite from West Compton, Lust, in Pheromone again, Come, Orgasm, Le Grind, Cindy C, Supercalifragilisticexy, and Rock Hard in a Funky Place. Notably on both albums, the one sweet song is genuinely sweet, Space or When We're In Love. Next, the music. The album draws on soul and R&B roots, completely ignoring the niceties of pop and to a very large degree rock. The lyrics are X-rated with capitals S, E and X, but the music is familiar and accessible to anyone familiar with African-American sounds. That's by Jeff Brown from The Complete Guide of the Music to Prince. It's actually a review of Come, but it could easily be a review of the Black Album as well. Musically, the elements are either semi-industrial, loose, pheromone. Apparently, Prince reportedly asked Energy and Ears to mix his records a bit harder after hearing Nine Inch Nails' Broken. Some of the tracks are experimental. Come has this expansive jazz, there's a solo harp and voice song. There's murky sounding stuff like Papa and Space. Even Let It Go has a tinge of Massive Attack trip hoppiness to it. On the other side, they're steeped in African-American music tradition. Uh, come with its jazz, uh, dark with its Philly soul kind of vibes, uh, race with its funk and hip hop, Papa with its blues. Dark shares more DNA with the Sign of the Times ballads and Pint Kashmir from the Love Sex era. Um, there's even a little guitar phrase on the outro that reminds me a bit of I Wish You'd Heaven. Ding, 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 ding. Experimental wild cards such as Solo or United for West Compton on both albums. Um, Cindy C and Pheromone are both driven by insistent hard drums. There's the dark blues roots of both Papa and Bob George that ties them together. Uh, it's interesting to note that Notable Prince song from that era didn't make either album and that's Days of Wild, which is an open criticism of rap of the time, much as Dead On It was in its day. I also wonder why Acknowledge Me didn't make the cut. He could have annexed the title, like Let It Go, if it was because it was two words. Feels like it would fit 
right with the songs in the Beautiful Experience short film. Uh, interestingly, the version of Plum on there isn't on the album. Maybe because this is the dawning of a new spiritual revolution fits Gold's themes better than Plum in its new all black and grey fitting. The Gold Experience is quite a rock album on the sly, maybe as most since Purple Rain and Until Lotus Flower, despite Chaos and Disorder's top-heavy rock reputation. Interactive, Endorphin and Strays of the World were all on early configurations of Plum, so was he intentionally holding back his big hitter rock material uh, at the time with the idea that Warner would not get its hands on it? I also find Orgasm interesting in the sense of maybe it's a sarcastic kiss-off to Warner, um, oh, you didn't hear enough guitar and sex stuff? Well, here, here. Th if this is all you think of me, or alternatively, if this is all you're worth. The, uh, it's effectively made out of some offshoots, cut-ups, uh, leftovers. Um, I remember that quote of him saying it would be so easy for me to put the guitar solo from Let's Go Crazy at the start of a song in a different key or something like that. So, in essence, is he doing this now to Warner to say goodbye, bye? Obviously, the sounds are from Vibrator and Private Joy and obviously his poem uh, all just smashed together. So it does kind of feel like he's like, here, have some leftovers. Here's a track. After all, Had You on Chaos and Disorder is absolutely definitely a, a bitter kiss off. The last words on the end of Orgasm are, I love you. This is a message to his fans on the end, and this is the very final words of Prince's discography as far as the artist planned at the time. The artwork for the Black album, none more black to quote Spinal Tap. For come, it's black and grey and funereal to say the least. Um, the shot shot outside La Sagrada Familia, cathedral in Barcelona, Spain, uh, acts as if it's a cemetery where the Black Album caused Prince to think about his own possible potential death, the Come Album artwork obsesses over it. It's also worth noting, uh, as a side note, that Prince started developing emo fringes before they were even a thing around this time, preempting the next wave of depressive teen music in the noughties. So again, Prince, as he was on the Black Album, is proving his edge and his blackness, though this time it's every shade of black, funky, jazzy, glitterly driven, even the goth type, but judging by the album cover, so in a sense, Prince repeated a cycle with Black Album and Love Sexy with Come and Gold, but this time by design. Kill off Prince with all the material he'd rather see thematically buried with him, while moving forward as the symbol with the message bright, clear and positive, a la The Gold Experience, just like Love Sexy. And to get truly free, he had to revisit Old Demons and Old Friends for Sale, which was a price he was willing to pay as long as they died with Prince, so that the artist could emerge butterfly-like on The Gold Experience. Come a butterfly straight on your skin. You go for me and I come again, as it said in Glam Slam from Love Sexy. In summation, I would say that not only has come the Black Album that it's okay to buy, but for a hot minute there, Black Album was as well. Uh, the artists were truly over and done with Warner, Prince, and all their trappings and ready to let it go. But when I say it's okay to buy, I mean for Warners and for us to buy. Don't expect Prince to promote it. He's already moved on, as he always did. Damn, Loudermilk was right. Does this mean I have to stop drinking now? <laughs>